Thank you, John, for your very kind invitation and your very kind introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here. At the beginning and outset of this talk, I would like, first of all, to ask your particular prayers for a number of special intentions. I have many friends in Central America, and I visited there in El Salvador, and now with the American forces moving in so menace menacingly, I hope that you will join me in praying for peace in that area and for a resolution of conflict. Also, I have a very close priest friend in Sri Lanka, formerly Ceylon, and he belongs to the Tamil minority, which is now being terribly persecuted, literally hundreds of people being assassinated in the streets, burned to death on buses and in uh, riots that are going on there now, and out of which the communists are hoping to make very great gains in that country. So I want you to pray for Father Francis Joseph and for Sri Lanka. I also ask your special prayers for my brother, Bishop of Hamilton, Bishop Paul uh, Redding, who is a classmate of mine from seminary days and who has cancer. And I want you to pray for God's healing for him. Father Bishop uh, Redding is spiritually serene, but physically very ill. So I would ask your prayers for him. And also for Father Sean O'Sullivan, whom I helped to direct to the seminary and who now is suffering from leukemia. Last night here, I met a young fellow whom I have known for many years, a good friend of mine, and he gave me the shocking news that two weeks ago he discovered that he has leukemia. I don't want to embarrass him by identifying him, but his name is Mike, and I want you to pray for Michael along with me. I would also like to express at the outset my very sincere thanks to uh, Wolf and Mary Musso, who are doing the translating uh, here, you know, for the uh, hard of hearing. And I would also like to thank the Portuguese a couple who are translating for the Portuguese community here. I really appreciate their... I wish you would give, express your appreciation to them. <clears throat> and now I would ask you to join with me in praying that uh, the Holy Spirit will guide me in what I have to say. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created. Knew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of the faithful. Grant that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Now, my topic is the electronic community versus the parish community. I don't know anything about the electronic community. I know quite a bit about the parish community. And the reason why I selected this topic, I hate to explain to you, it's so ridiculous, but Father Vince Van Zutphen was on my back to select a topic, and he gave me a list. And I didn't even have time to think about them, so I wasn't able to pick one, and I finally went eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch him, you know, oh, I <clears throat> don't want to be racist. But uh, so that's how I ended up with the electronic church. Nevertheless, I hope that I'll be able to say something useful about it. It reminds me of the story of Chesterton and George Bernard Shaw. Uh, Gilbert Keith Chesterton was a great, big, fat man with a big punch. He was one of the outstanding English writers of this 20th century. George Bernard Shaw was a skinny, ascetic-looking, agnostic, and iconoclast. They met one day, and Chesterton, fat and rotund, punched Shaw in the stomach. These guys were always arguing with one another, and he said, you make it look as though there's a famine in the land. And Shaw said, well, you make it uh, explain the reason why. As a matter of fact, Chesterton got even. A few days later, they met one another, and Shaw poked Chesterton in the stomach. He said, what are you going to call the baby? Well, Chesterton said, if it's a boy, I'm going to call it Gilbert Keith Chesterton. His wife's name was Francis. He said, if it's a girl, I'm going to call it Francis Chesterton. If it's nothing but hot air, I'm going to call it George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> it's my devout hope that what I'm giving you now will not be hot air. Uh, in examining my title, the electronic community versus the parish community, the key word in this is community. Now, we all take for granted that we understand what community means. It's one of those in words. It's a very comforting word. The community, the charismatic community, you know, the anglophone community, the francophone community the Portuguese community. Sounds good. Sounds comforting. 
And yet, when we begin to analyze the way that word is used, we find that oftentimes it is used in ways that is contrary to what it really means. One of the Latin words, really the Latin word from which community derives is the word communio, the same word from which communion comes. And community really means union with another or with others. It means being bound together with others. That's essentially what the, what the word means. Therefore, if we talk about community of nations, as the politicians love to do, when we examine the world scene of wars and revolutions, of ideological confrontation, of manipulative alliances, of the callous disregard of the poor, of the crushing of human rights, uh, of the total indifference of the rich nations to the poor, we are reminded of children battling in the street, and we're asked to call that a community. Can we call it a community when nations are scheming, plotting, subverting, hating, warring, repressing, torturing, and dominating? Are they united with one another? If they are not, they are not a community. And being disunited, they are no community of nations. Even a group of people traveling together on one conveyance, on a bus, a plane, a train, to a common destination, they may be indifferent to one another. The crowded conditions may even make them hostile. Even though they are together, in a physical sense, they do not form a community. And neither can many of the other things that we normal, normally call community. What does form community? First of all, community is made up of people. But people form community only when they are born to it and accept and affirm that into which they are born or when they freely choose it. Physical nearness has nothing to do with it. But there must be some bond of unity, some common origin, some common purpose, which turns a disparate and discordant crowd into a motivated and perhaps inspired and dynamic community. In short, it is relationship that forms community, inherited or chosen, natural or contrived, permanent or temporary. These are what create community. The purposes of community can be political, they can be economic, they can be recreational or cultural, they can be profound, they can be trivial, they can be atheistic, they can be religious, they can be superstitious, they can be scientific. The purpose of a community could be as spontaneous as throwing a party. Very casual, brief encounter. Could be as casual as having a game of cards. Or the purpose could be as challenging as the determination to change the world. What is absolutely necessary if the community is to generate enthusiasm, joy, and power. That community must be able to share with all its members the purpose for which it exists. You know, a, a card game in which somebody is bored or disinterested is going to be, a, you know, a very unsatisfying card game. A party in which half the participants don't want to be there is going to be a pretty dull affair. And a church in which many of the people have not caught the vision will be a dispirited one, a one which lacks the fire, the power, and is unable to generate the enthusiasm which is needed. The community must be able to share with all its members its fundamental vision, its purpose, its reason for existence. Community is essential for human beings because we are social by nature. Without community, we are neither loved nor loving. We are neither known nor knowing. We are capable neither of giving nor of receiving. We are capable neither of true growth nor of contributing to the growth of others. The statement of God in Genesis is of profound significance. It is not good for man to be alone. And that does not apply only to marriage. What does true community accomplish for us? In our first natural community, one which is in grave danger today, the family, 
we learn what love is. And receiving it without question and without condition, we come to appreciate our own self-worth. Sister was talking about that, getting up in the morning, looking in the mirror and saying, aren't I marvelous? Because I am loved. Where do you learn that, that first sense of, of self-worth, if not in the family? Learning to accept and love ourselves is the precondition for learning to love others and for appreciating God's love. The family affirms us in ourselves just as we are. It appreciates our gifts, it provides a vehicle for us to use them, and it teaches us to trust those who love us. It gives us our indispensable security in ourselves and in others without which we retreat into a prison of self-doubt and fear. True community initiates us in our first steps in emotional, intellectual, physical, spiritual, and cultural growth. It humanizes us. It transmits values. It provides ideals and reasons for living. It allows us to begin the process of maturing, which in my opinion means ultimately taking a full share of responsibility for all the communities to which we belong. To be mature means not to be a parasite, but to be a contributor. Not to be just a receiver, but a giver. It means to accept responsibility for others. And without that, a community is doomed to die. What then endangers human community? I want to share with you what I call my litany of loneliness. What sadness there is in this world of ours. A sadness rooted in the absence, in the absence or failure of relationships. A sadness which Mother Teresa frequently refers to when she says that the poverty of North America is far more abysmal than the poverty of the third world. And she is talking about the spiritual and emotional poverty of loneliness and lack of love. Now, loneliness is not solitude, because we're, we are in solitude when we retreat into moments of contemplative prayer. We go there not to be without someone. We go there to be with God. And indeed, into that solitude, all true contemplatives carry with them the anguish, the pain of the whole world, and they carry with them in their hearts the whole community of God's people. Loneliness is not silence. For how often have we experienced the rich love which radiates when we are speechless but present to one we love, as when a mother's tender gaze embraces her sleeping child, Loneliness is not the absence of one we love, although that can bring emotional pangs of sadness, but that is not loneliness, for when one I love is far away, that someone, and between him and me, all the ground is holy. And I read somewhere recently on uh, a death card, a very beautiful remark, which says, suggests to me that there is not even loneliness when we lose someone in death. Because when someone we love dies in grace, they go no farther from us than God. And God is very near. I'll tell you what loneliness is. It is the abandonment of the elderly by their children and those who should love them. It is the warehousing of the aged and infirm in institutions and nursing homes, which feed and clean them like good animals, but do not love them. Loneliness is the lot of the children of broken homes who blame themselves for the departure of parents and an abandonment they cannot understand. Loneliness is the anguish and the guilt of the abandoned spouse when separation or divorce has destroyed a marriage. It is the haunting sense of failure and rejection which surrounds relationships destroyed. Loneliness is the anguish of the mortally ill who fear death 
who fear that journey into a dark night where only one who has gone before can walk with them. And how profound the loneliness of those who do not know the Jesus who promises to be there, the Atikam, the one who will walk that way with them to the light. Loneliness is the lot of those who, having been rejected, reject themselves as unworthy of being loved. Loneliness is the lot of those who cannot share their deepest fears or, and feelings, who cannot communicate who and what they are. Loneliness is the lot of those who hide their true selves behind masks of friendliness or joy, behind masks of confidence or success, behind masks of vanity and boasting, because they cannot believe that we could love them if we knew what they were really like. If we knew that they are the sinners that we ourselves recognize ourselves to be. Loneliness is the lot of the poor in a world which counts only riches as success. It is the lot of the unemployed in a world which is success and production oriented. It is the lot of the handicapped in a society which prizes only youth and physical beauty and physical integrity and the ability to function well. All these lonely people whom I described are the Lazaruses of this world who lie rejected beneath the tables of the rich and are demeaned because the pampered lapdogs of the successful and the wealthy have first choice of the scraps which fall from their master's table. But then there is the loneliest loneliness of the rich in the terror of re relationships which might cost, fearful of friendships which may be motivated by love of their money rather than of them. They are locked in prisons of their own devising, prisons which they could open from within but will not, prisons which not even love can open from the outside because they close their ears to the call to open. Like the rich young man described last night by Father Thomas, whom Jesus loved and called, to whom he said, if you would be perfect, sell what you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. He went away sad because of his great wealth. There is the loneliness of sin, the loneliness of lust, which pervades our world, that counterfeit of love, which despises commitment and relationship, but parades beautiful bodies, in slick magazines to excite passion and so reduce people to things. What loneliness can compare to that of one who cries out to be loved or wanted but ends up only used and discarded like another pretty package or an em empty soft drink tin which has no turn-in value? Finally, there is the loneliness of being human of being mystery to ourselves and others, of being unable to grasp, much less communicate, the deepest yearnings of our hearts. This is a small shadow of the loneliness of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, prostrate, alone, before the enormity of human sin, bleeding under a burden no one else but God, his Father, could understand in all its evil his closest friends yielding to sleep when he needed the comfort of their presence, if not their understanding. There, my friends, is my litany of loneliness, and it is incomplete. The remedies of loneliness are the building blocks of true community. All that builds relationships will build community. Joining with others toward a common goal even if it is a transient association, will give some meaning to moments of our lives. Communication, which is truly open, which listens as well as speaks, is clearly essential for community. But most of all, we need love. Love which is profound. Love which is unconditional. Love which is permanent. Love which is utterly reliable. Love which gives to me, but does not manipulate me. Love which understands, and love 
which forgives. Love which believes in me, love which trusts me, love which perfects me, love which changes and transforms me into that which my lover sees possible for me to be. And that love, my brothers and sisters, is God. That love is the spirit of Jesus Christ. And that is the love that ultimately forms community. But community, if it is to last, must be formed of persons, all of whom receive and all of whom give, all of who, whom are loved and all of whom love. You know, one re thing we should be praying for right now is for the World Council of Churches, which has begun in Vancouver. It is a crucial meeting for the future of the major denominations. And it has had a good beginning. One of the speakers at the opening ceremonies, you may have seen him, was Jean Vanier. I only heard a few mo moments of what he said. But Jean, speaking at the opening, spoke movingly of Paul, a young retarded adult. To the superficial observer, Paul is a receiver of love. Jean Vanier, a giver. But no, says Vanier, Paul has taught me more than I have taught him. He has revealed me to myself in my pride, my selfishness, my self-sufficiency, and in that my unwillingness to love without restraint, my willingness to set limits to my love. He has called forth in me powers to love I did not know existed. I owe to him more than he owes to me. Therefore, community is always made not only of those who are loved, but each one must both be loved and loved. Now, in the light of all that, what do I have to say finally about electronic and parish communities? I have no fierce denunciation of the television ministries, which I presume are meant by the term electronic community. I am sure that they give comfort to many humble and lonely people who without them would find lives filled with even less. For those hungry for a human voice or companionship, television ministries can create the illusion that someone is speaking to them face to face. There is an immediacy about the media. Someone who cares enough to be concerned about their spiritual good. Someone who brings a message of God's love. Someone who wants to help them alleviate their fears and secret guilt. Or, more dangerously, someone with a miraculous formula to heal all wounds, solve all problems, dispel all sadness, and ensure new meaning for lives grown dull. It reinforces its message often, the television productions, by parading before us its own collection of saints. Men and women who testify how faith in Jesus Christ has drawn them from darkness to light, from sorrow to joy. And it reminds me that we in the church have for far too long neglected the saints who are human beings like us and who in their openness to the Father, in their total openness to the Father and to the transforming presence of the Spirit can inspire us. Television ministries have much to teach us. I do not believe, and I say it, I consider it unfortunate. I do not believe that such programs form true community, since they simplify and by so doing tend to distort the Christian message. They cannot build the permanent and reliable relationships of love, which are the indispensable cement of Christian community. They are, in a sense, the victims of their own TV medium, which is devised to promote consumer interests, instant gratification, and an audience of passive receivers rather than of active participants. From my own observations, and they have been limited, I have been distressed to see miracles promised on order. Surely within the next half hour, the time allotted to our program, you will be able to get the miracle you need. You can have it, whatever you want, physical or emotional healing, Business success, you name it, you get it. That is not the way Jesus operated, and it is not authentic. There is a tendency, a lack of humility, glorifying the evangelist rather than Jesus, 
whose name and power tend to become tools for the glory of the evangelists, many of whom preen and strut and shout their claims to extraordinary power. How little like the Jesus who emptied himself and who reminded us that God rejects the proud and gives his grace to the humble. And these programs are no strangers to manipulative techniques of Hollywood and consumer advertising. The polished performance, the seductive music, and the blatant commercial pitch. Indeed, the only participation offered to the viewer is frequently to send money, a procedure certain to get you fixed forever on a list which churns out of the computer a personalized letter from the evangelist which is no more personalized than electronic impulses, but the ultimate denial of a truly personal relationship, dunning you for money for the evangelist's good purposes. And then it appears to me that the television ministry, with a few exceptions, is that of a middle class supporting a middle class without any evidence of the poor who are the beloved of Jesus. Most damaging to true community are manipulation of people. Last Sunday I watched a particular show in which a well-known revivalist came close to using what I would describe as psychological violence and spiritual manipulation to compel young people in his audience who were drug users to reveal themselves to the thousands gathered there, claiming all the while that God had revealed to him who they were, where they were sitting. An arrogant, vain and oppressive performance contrasted to Jesus, who welcomed sinners, who ate with them, and who gently, gently, with full reverence for their freedom, summoned them to repentance with his parable, his gentle, non-directive parable of the prodigal son and the lost sheep. My final reservation about TV evangelism, and it is my most profound one, is the absence of the cross. The hymns may proclaim the old rugged cross, but in fact the meaning of the cross in each life, the need to deny ourselves, to take up the cross and to follow Christ, to follow his path, not our own, to accept what he sends and not what we would rather have, that seems to me to disappear in the blind consumerism which presents God as the all but automatic dispenser of the things you want and need today. They tend to have God do our will rather than strengthen us to do His. There is, in my opinion, no true electronic community. There is an electronic industry. What has the parish community, community to offer in contrast to the increasingly stiff competition of TV? I haven't got time to read you the litany of my complaints about parishes, but I know full well their shortcomings. So often the atmosphere seems impersonal, the people are not warm or welcoming, the preaching is dull, the music unattractive, and the sense of community inadequate at best. Therefore, what I am going to say is something about what the parish community should be, is intended to be, and can be what John Paul II has said about it, and what Bishop Gervais and I are trying to make it and help it become with the cooperation of our many priests in the Diocese of London. John Paul II said, the parish must rediscover its vocation to be a warm and welcoming family home where those are, who are united in one faith and one baptism, confirmed in one spirit, are nourished by the bread of truth and the bread of life in the paschal mystery of the Eucharist, and from which they go forth to serve the needs of all the world. There is an ideal of the parish. That is its vocation. That is what you must help it to rediscover and become. After 20 days of prayerful discernment in Guelph over the last year, the Senate of Priests with Bishop Marcel and I came to the conclusion that we want our parishes to grow as a living witness to what we celebrate in the Eucharist. Parish is aware of being the ministering people of God, a welcoming family that dares to be enthusiastic and creative in discerning, in embracing the poor, in healing and reaching out the good news. 
The parish is a Eucharistic community. No TV community or industry can be Eucharistic. And what is not Eucharistic is not of the church. And which is not what is not of the church, as Bishop Marcel said last night, cannot be adequately and fully of Christ. Without the Eucharist, we do not have the Paschal mystery. Without the Eucharist, we do not have the mystery of redemption. Without the Eucharist, we do not have the power of Jesus Christ at work in the world. And without the Eucharist, we do not have the power to die to self, to live for God and for one another. In the Eucharist, we do not only celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus, who becomes present on our altars under the appearances of bread and wine, offering himself to the Father as he did on Calvary in the self-same sacrifice. We not only celebrate that reality, we not only adore the Christ present, we participate. Now, we participate externally in song and prayer, in reading, in ushering, in serving, and in ministry. But what is inwardly expressed in humble repentance is faith, death to self-seeking, deep union with the love and self-giving of Jesus Christ. And that deep union is effected by the Holy Spirit who leads us to embrace the cross. Those who would expel the cross from Christianity expel Christ. And forget the words of Paul, who refused to preach in human eloquence, but preached only Jesus Christ and him crucified. And there can be no Christian who walks with Jesus only in joy. The way of God leads to the cross. The way to Jesus Christ involves de denying ourselves, taking up the cross, dying with him in order that we may live. And it is that self-giving love of Jesus Christ which forms the parish community. It is our cooperation with that love. It is our manifestation of that self-giving love that helps the parish to rediscover its vocation, to be a warm and welcoming uh, family which reaches out, a warm and welcoming home which summons home those who have gone, which heals those who need, need healing, which baptizes those who need baptizing, which cares for all the abandoned and the lonely of this world. If I were to tell you my litany of what the parish ought to be, I would have to repeat my litany of loneliness and say, there, to meet that loneliness, the parish must come. The loneliness of the aged, the loneliness of the sick, the loneliness of the young, the loneliness of the unemployed, the loneliness of the desperate, the loneliness of the poor, the loneliness of those who do not yet believe, the, the unhappiness, the sorrow, the sadness of the dying who do not know Jesus Christ. This is the role of the parish. This is how it rediscovers its vocation, and this is what our parishes are striving to become. Do not despise them. They are your home. They are made of sinners as you are, like you and me. Go there and help renew them to rediscover what they must be. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, true spiritual community is God's gift through baptism. It is through baptism with water and the Holy Spirit that he has grafted you into himself, that we have become branches of that true vine, but we do not choose the vine. It is our beloved vine, Jesus Christ, who chooses us and grafts us into his own body, which is the church, which is our parish. As we mature, we must choose it and help it to rediscover its vocation to become what it is. Now, there are many other things that I could say but I'm going to bring what I have to an end. Let me say only in conclusion. Earlier in this talk, I told you that a community is only alive. It only generates power if all its members share the vision, the purpose. We must communicate this vision of the parish 
as that warm and welcoming family home, which in the Eucharist celebrates all that it is, reaching out to the community, sharing its goods, sharing its faith, evangelizing, healing, teaching, caring. We must recapture that vision, and we must summon all to share that vision, and to be not only recipients, treating their parish like some kind of spiritual service station where they come to get what they can get, but where they see it as an opportunity to come, to give what they can give, to share what the Holy Spirit has already given to them. <clears throat> My brothers and sisters, our parish must make an option for the poor, the spiritually poor who need the good news. We must make an option for the lonely, for the sick, for the separated and the divorced. We must make an option for the sinners. We must love them, and we must love those who hate us. That is the command of Jesus, and that can only be done by the power of the Spirit of God. We must be a praying, sacrificing, discerning family clinging to the cross of Jesus Christ. And when we are all those things, then we will have started to become the true community which God calls us to be. God calls us to be. God calls us to be. God.